Hello, my name is Neil Bishop and I'm very happy to be presenting at this NAFEMS event in Madrid. The title of my presentation will be CA Fatigue, a state-of-the-art perspective. I'll cover six sections in the presentation. First of all, I'll give an introduction to CA-based fatigue. I'll discuss what is similitude and how that helps us to link together fatigue with FE. And then I'll discuss how fatigue and FE can be combined with dynamic analysis. And then I'll then finally talk about two new methods, solver embedded fatigue in the time domain and solver embedded fatigue in the frequency domain. I'm the CEO of a company called CAE Fatigue Limited. The company specializes in frequency-based fatigue and dynamics topics, and the people that work in the company have been, or would be regarded to be pioneers in the field. It's essentially all we do, frequency-based fatigue and dynamics. So I'm going to begin by giving an introduction to fatigue, especially when it's connected in the CAE environment. Let me begin by discussing the topic of fatigue. Of course, fatigue is the process by which metals and other materials degrade or fail over time when loads are applied which are well below the yield. So it's a particularly um, uh, uh, discomforting kind of failure because it's usually unexpected. It's not a new phenomenon. It's been a problem that we've been dealing with for nearly 200 years. And what's interesting about fatigue is that when it was first um, studied, when it was first um, observed as a, as a problem, uh, we quickly came up with solutions, even though the uh, me underlying mechanism was not particularly well understood. So we'll see later, this is the, the background to why fatigue is treated in the way it is, more or less like a black box kind of process where we don't really understand what causes it, or we didn't used to understand what caused it, but we have quite good empirical tools for dealing with it. So following these early failures, investigations would take place and it would be discovered that failures had occurred uh, well below the uh, anticipated yield strength of the material. So this was obviously a, a, a major problem uh, that, that had to be resolved. So a lot of uh, investigations and scientific endeavour uh, began uh, around 200 years ago. So the first work on fatigue took place uh, nearly 200 years ago, uh, in fact, uh, early work by Albert and Poncelet looked at the problem of repeated loads and its effect on the, on the, on the materials. Perhaps the most um, important piece of work took place in the mid-1800s, that of Verler, who did systematic investigations of uh, the effect of repeated loads on those railway axles we were looking at in the previous two slides. Um, so at this time, uh, the phenomenon or rather the relationship between the applied loads and the consequences of those loads was quite well understood. In fact, we'll, look, we'll see in a minute that Verler came up with uh, design approaches which are essentially the same approaches that we use today. Um, but little was known about the actual underlying cause. Uh, but subsequent work by others uh, discovered that actually, although stress had been uh, focused on us as one of the early uh, indicators of fatigue, it quickly became obvious that it was strain rather than stress that was the indicator and so there was a, uh, a, a, a number of studies that looked at that relationship, the relationship between the, the stress and the strain, the, the level of plasticity that was involved. Uh, other work by people like Goodman looked at the influence of mean stresses. Uh, and then in, in the uh, beginning of the 1900s work by Ewing and Humphrey uh, proposed that fatigue was actually caused by cracks growing through the material. So that was a very important uh, point in time where the real uh, cause, the real mechanism of fatigue was being um, uh, discussed for the first time. Of course, all of these um, approaches, as we'll, as we'll discuss shortly, uh, look at the deformation on the structure and use that to determine uh, failure. Uh, but of course, underneath what Ewing and Humphrey uh, had uh, uh, stated was that it was an underlying crack growth process. And the uh, background to this, uh, the studies in this area are those of fracture mechanics. And of course, of course, Griffith in 1920 is one of the pioneers in terms of the, the background technology related to fracture mechanics. Uh, so that, if you like, spawned the birth of the approach we would call um, damage tolerant design and crack growth uh, analysis. And that is a parallel method of determining fatigue damage. 
then in the uh, 1940s onwards, uh, there were more sophisticated tools developed for dealing with fatigue, uh, such as the, the Palmgren minor rule for dealing with cumulative damage. Um, Coffin and Manson introduced the concept of, of plastic strains and the uh, the basis of what we now know of as the strain life approach that's used extensively in the automotive industry. Uh, Paris proposed um, material properties for crack growth uh, behavior in the 60s. Uh, Peterson formally proposed the strain life method in the 60s. Uh, in the, at the end of the 60s, we uh, were introduced to the concept of cycle counting by Matsuishi and Endo. Uh, this was initially a time-based phenomenon, but in the 80s, um, Turan Derlich introduced the concept of rainflow counting from uh, the frequency domain using so-called PSDs, power spectral densities. And then in the uh, 1990s, uh, uh, CAE, FE-based methods were combined with these fatigue tools and also with dynamic analysis methods to create a tool called P-Fatigue. Uh, which was a patron based fatigue tool uh, developed by uh, ENCODE and PDA at the time. This later be became known as MSC Fatigue and was one of the earliest commercial tools for doing FE-based fatigue calculations. Uh, then, um, very recently, um, this, this capability has been, if you like, extended into what we might call a solver-embedded fatigue, where there is no graphical user interface involved in the process. Instead, it's thought of as part of the solver. In fact, it's more or less thought of as an output request on the solver process. Again, in 2013, this was uh, primarily time-based uh, and uh, very, very recently, this has now been extended to a frequency-based solver embedded approach uh, in the form of a product called CAE Fatigue Vibration, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. So the first work on This slide covers some of that same history, but in a different form, and also introduces the concept that um, a, uh, a sophisticated approach to this issue of, of, of calculating the, uh, the life or the fatigue damage in a structure involves not just consideration of the fatigue technology, but also consideration of how the CAE um, method, finite element based methods are going to be used to generate the stresses and strains that are used in those fatigue calculations. And also the fact that uh, built into this overall approach must be some consideration of dynamics because it's most likely that there will be some uh, level of dynamic response in the structure that you're analyzing. So this brings me to the question, what is fatigue? And although the question seems relatively simple, the answer is rather complicated because we actually have two different perspectives on the same uh, un underlying phenomena. And the reason for that is that, first of all, fatigue, when it was first um, uh, encountered nearly 200 years ago, was treated as a, a uh, deformation-based phenomenon. In other words, the, the studies that took place looked at the stresses and strains being applied to the structures, and then they used those stresses and strain, con stress and strain conditions to somehow estimate or evaluate how long the structure or the part would last. And that's the basis of um, the stress life approach and the strain life approach, which is really the main part of this presentation today. The reason why the, the, the question is a little complicated is because there's another way of looking at fatigue, and that is to consider it as crack growth. And crack propagation methods are, um, uh, if you like, a parallel way of evaluating uh, the same phenomenon, except in this case, there's a much more sophisticated approach to the, the problem, which takes into account the material behavior in a much more fundamental way. The difficulty for us in terms of connecting this with uh, finite element methods is that the uh, crack propagation approach, the uh, material behavior based approach, is not very well connected with FE. In fact, it's really not connected at all. Whereas the stress and strain based approaches are very well connected. Um, but that also brings us to another issue, and that is the, the deformation based approach is essentially a black box approach. In other words, we evaluate the stresses or strains on the structure, and we, we use those in an empirical approach to evaluate fatigue life. There is very little uh, e e e e theoretical basis to that approach. It's almost entirely empirical. It's all based on test and curve-fitting test results, and then using those 
uh, curve fitted test results in subsequent fatigue designs. Another complicated aspect of the question is what is the failure that is associated with the question what is fatigue? And again, this is complicated by the fact that there are more than one uh, there's more than one approach to this uh, 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 to this particular uh, task. In fact, there's more than one approach if you deal with the deformation based approach because you can consider fatigue failure to be different things such as the failure of the, the, the uh, complete separation of the part, it can be considered to be the initiation of a crack, it can, can be considered to be the loss of stiffness in a particular specimen, it could, could even be considered to be a loss of functionality in a printed circuit board of an electronics part. Or for example with uh, composites it could be considered to be uh, delamination, and if we are really considering crack propagation, uh, then it could be considered to be a crack either growing too fast or becoming too big. So let's assume that we've defined the failure that we're uh, uh, wanting to have in our particular uh, design approach. And we've done our testing. We've created a curve from that, uh, that test data. And so the fatigue design becomes a very straightforward um, process and it revolves around uh, the question whether we know two things accurately enough. First of all, do we have the material properties in the form of a line fitted through the test data in an accurate format? So that's the first thing. Can we get the material properties correctly defined? Secondly, can we uh, define the stresses or strains coming off our structure in an accurate and appropriate way? Because if we can do those two things, if we can get the material properties accurately defined, if we can define the stresses or strains coming off our structure, then that, in theory, using this black box approach, allows us to calculate cycles to failure or our fatigue life for the part or for the structure. So this is really the, the uh, underlying um, uh, uh, assumption in the overall approach that we can define materials properly and that we can define the stresses or strains coming off our structure in an, a correct manner. And because that approach doesn't actually make any assumptions about the material that's used to do the testing, then as long as we can do the same, make the same assumptions, that is, we can adequately define our material properties in a form of an SN diagram or strain life diagram, and we can adequately calculate the uh, deformations coming off the structure, we can apply that approach to any material. For example, we can apply it to composites. Um, but of course then the, the issue becomes further complicated by the fact that composite materials will be both layered and directional. So the underlying assumption that you can use the black box approach to do this kind of calculation is, is reasonable, but you have to be aware of what it is you're trying to do in terms of the material itself. So the, the uh, black box approach is, is very versatile and allows the uh, stress-based or strain-based approach to fatigue to be extended and applied to materials that otherwise wouldn't seem to be appropriate. So the, the black box approach using deformations to estimate uh, fatigue failure or fatigue life is the basis of both the stress-based approach or SN approach and the strain-based approach or EN approach. And those two methods are widely used in different industries. SN or stress life approach tends to be more widely used in the aerospace community and the strain life approach uh, tends to be more widely used in the aerospace community. Uh, as I said earlier, there is also the, the parallel approach of, of, of doing crack propagation, and this is tied very uh, closely to the, uh, the uh, approach of damage tolerance that is used uh, extensively for uh, certain parts of aircraft uh, uh, design. So, for example, the, the fuselage of an airplane will be designed using crack propagation methods, coupled with a damage tolerance philosophy uh, that will, uh, in theory, allow the, uh, the, the, the part you're designing to stay in service forever. And instead of designing the part for a specific life at the initial stage of design, instead what we do is we calculate how long the part can stay in service before the next inspection, and then we assume that it might be possible to repair any, any cracks that are found, and then you then leave that uh, part or or structure in service for a follow-on period.
So damage tolerant design as, uh, connected with crack propagation is used uh, in a very focused way for specific parts mainly related to aircraft design. So, assuming we are implementing some kind of deformation-based approach, either stress-based or strain-based for our fatigue calculation, we then have to connect that calculation with the finite element environment, with the CAE environment, and also with some form of dynamic analysis if our structure has any, any uh, uh, significant level of dynamic behavior. So the challenge for us in terms of, of CAE-based fatigue is to connect these three things, these three topics together, in an appropriate way and to manage that process to our advantage. And so this then brings us to the concept of similitude. So fatigue is a topic which was uh, initially developed and, uh, and uh, created for mostly test-based situations. We're now trying to apply it to finer element-based environments and so we need to make this assumption of similitude in order to do that. And fundamentally, what similitude tells us is that in order to be able to apply fatigue methods in the CA environment, we need to be able to assume that the stress conditions in our finite element model at the critical location, so if we're able to take a small volume, a small cube of material, and assess the stress conditions for that critical cube of material, we need to be able to assume that those stress conditions are identical in every way to the stress conditions in the critical volume of material that would, have, would exist in the specimens that were tested in order to create the material properties. So similitude says the test specimen has the same stress conditions as the finite element model. Uh, is that true? Um, absolutely not, because in order to make that assumption, we, we would assume the stresses as in the test specimen, the stresses are stationary. That means they um, don't, uh, 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 move around with uh, in direction with time. We would assume they're uniaxial, as in the test specimen. We would assume that they are um, constant amplitude uh, and zero mean. So those four assumptions are uh, are essentially assumptions that we make when we do the testing. And uh, similitude would 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 insist that we make that assumption with the fine element model. Of course, in reality, that's not true. And it's also not true if we look at strain-based methods and we try to make the same assumption of similitude. So how do we get around that? And the way we get around that is by using commercial fatigue solvers that allow us to force similitude. So in, in simple terms, what we do is we take the stress conditions which don't conform and we condition them using various uh, methods. So for example, with the issue of mean stress correction, we would apply something like a Goodman uh, mean stress correction approach and essentially what that would do is take the stresses in the FE model which have a mean and convert them into stress conditions which don't have a mean. Uh, similarly, the issue of constant amplitude stresses in the test uh, specimen and, and the fact that the stresses in the finite element model are not constant amplitude, the way, we in, 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 the way that we enforce similitude for that situation is by using something called rain flow cycle counting. And similarly for uh, the issue of stationarity of stresses. So we would typically use uh, an appropriate approach. And there are lots of different options for that uh, that can be used, including the so-called critical plane method. So what we, what we do in effect is condition the stresses to ensure that similitude is, is, is um, satisfied. So let's just consider this issue in a little bit more detail. How do we link fatigue with FE? And a typical finite element analysis uh, 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 task would be to apply a series of simultaneous loads to the structure, calculate for those loads the resultant stress conditions, and then use those stress conditions to estimate fatigue life. A typical fringe plot of uh, a result such as fatigue damage or fatigue life would then typically look like this. Uh, with one uh, caveat that I'm going to uh, apply here, you only get uh, such nice uh, 
uh, fringe plots if you plot the damage result with a log scale. And whilst that gives very nice results, it also is very misleading because what we tend to find with fatigue damage results is that they are a very localized phenomenon. Typically, you will get high damage in a very small zone and then uh, the next element along might have almost no damage. So fatigue is a very localized phenomenon and this also gives us difficulties in assessing the results and making sure that they are reasonable. So typically what, what you should do once you've got the result is go into the local conditions and check what happened at that, at that critical location. In practice, this would typically be done in the following way. First of all, the stress solve part of the process and the fatigue solve part of the process traditionally have been separate. So the stress solve would be uh, done in order to find stress field results to unit load conditions. That would be done with Nastran or ANSYS or Abacus. And that would typically be done almost like a pre-processing stage to fatigue calculation. The stress solve would then be switched off. Those stress results would be transferred into a secondary process, the fatigue solve process. And in this fatigue solve process, the fatigue material properties, the fatigue loads would be applied uh, the stress time history would be calculated, fatigue analysis would be performed, and the fringe plot would be calculated. And then, as I said in the previous slide, what you would then do, uh, if you were proceeding correctly, would be to look at those results, check them carefully, check them for um, various uncertainties that exist in the overall process, uncertainties related to loads, uncertainties related to the material properties, uncertainties related to the fine element modeling. And you would see or check if you are happy with the overall results. You may want to apply a more sophisticated fatigue method. You may want to do sensitivity studies. So there are a lot of different uh, tasks involved in this process uh, and a number of complicated issues. Issues like what stress output should you use? Should you use the component results, the von Mises result, the principal result? Should you use nodal or element averaging? Um, should you uh, or, or do you have involved in your part components that can't be treated using so-called material SN curves? In other words, things like welds, where the stress conditions uh, that you need to evaluate are not the peak stress conditions, but instead some kind of reference stress. And finally, uh, another issue that might be of, of, of interest is the difference between so-called KT, the stress concentration factor that you obtain from the model, and KF, which is the um, fatigue strength uh, reduction factor, which is uh, or should be tied very closely to KT. So KF is really what happens, what actually happens with the model in terms of fatigue uh, reduction when stress increase. And KT is the actual stress concentration that you get from a, a fine element prediction or fine element estimate. And what we often find is that for very sharp notches, these two parameters, KT, the fine element prediction, and KF, the fatigue prediction, divert or diverge uh, somewhat. So these uh, can diverge for various reasons. And one, one answer, one explanation, is the issue of stress gradients that occur in the model. Another issue is the, uh, or, or explanation for the difference, is the effect of plastic zones at the cracked tips that may somehow have an influence on the actual stress that's being um, that being felt in the fatigue calculation. So although we do have very sophisticated methods, commercial tools for doing these kinds of fatigue calculations, um, don't be fooled into thinking the overall process is, is, is a very straightforward thing. There are a lot of very sophisticated issues associated with the calculation. And what's interesting is these issues are not really related to the fatigue calculation itself, but instead they're related to the process of conditioning the stresses before you then put those stresses into the fatigue calculation. So a typical commercial integrated FE-based fatigue design would then follow the, uh, the, 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 the flow I'm, I'm showing on this slide. There would be various inputs, including the FE model, uh, which has the geometry, the loading, the material properties. These three inputs would be used then in, in a specific kind of fatigue calculation, that either being stress-based fatigue, strain-based fatigue, weld fatigue, spot weld fatigue, or even uh, crack propagation damage tolerance. And based on the particular method that you use, uh, 
there would be different kinds of results, including fringe plots like the ones I showed on a previous slide, or sensitivity results, or even specific results at specific grid points in the model, like damage distributions, or stress time histories, or if you were working in the frequency domain, power spectral density PSD results. And of course, finally, there is one other type of input uh, output which is often very useful, which is just a straightforward tabular results listing in some kind of comma-separated uh, values file or CSV file. So let's assume that we've come up with an appropriate method for linking together fatigue with FE and we're comfortable with that process. The next task is to build in or incorporate methods for uh, allowing for the dynamic response that may or may not exist in the structure. So I'm going to cover a number of different options for this over the next few slides. So the dynamic uh, analysis challenge may be that we're trying to simulate the actual um, loading that exists in the real world environment. So it may be the ground uh, profile, or it may be the acceleration input to a particular part on a vehicle. In this particular case, we're looking at the, um, the uh, dynamic behavior of the frame on the top of a tractor. Or it may be that we're trying to replicate the uh, conditions on some kind of test rig. Uh, essentially, these two uh, challenges are identical in terms of the fine element model, uh, but they may have uh, slightly different uh, procedures for, def for defining the loads. Central to this task are, is the issue of the dynamic properties of the structure. And it's important to realize that these dynamic properties are connected closely with the modal uh, resonances or the mode shapes of the structure and their associated frequencies. Um, and also it's, it's something else that's very important about these mode shapes. These mode shapes tell us the, um, the ability of the structure to resonate. They tell us the potential of the structure to resonate and to have dynamic response. They do not tell you, or they do not tell us that there will be dynamic behavior. You will only get dynamic behavior if you have loading at or near the frequencies of the modes and that that loading is in the same direction as the modal movement or I, the participation, the mass participation of those modes. So, for example, the mode behavior at mode one, which is essentially a, a, a forward backwards flap of that mode, will be excited primarily by, by loading that picks up the mass movement of that mode in that direction. So, Important to remember that modal uh, mode shapes, the uh, eigenvectors and the and the mode frequencies, the eigenvalues, uh, are telling us system properties. They're telling us potential to resonate, but they are not necessarily telling us there will be resonance. The way we uh, decide or evaluate if resonance is going to occur, if it's necessary to include it in our analysis, is by, by a careful uh, a comparison between the loading frequencies that you have in the frequencies of load that you're applying to the structure and the uh, mode resonance frequencies that you have in the structure itself. So what we would typically do is look at the lowest um, modal frequency, the lowest first natural frequency of the structure, and then compare that with the maximum frequency of loading that we expect uh, for that structure. If we can separate those two by a sufficient amount, uh, then we can assume the structure is only statically responsive. And typically we would look for there to be a separation of about three. So if the first natural frequency is more than three times the maximum loading frequency, we can assume that the structure is only statically responsive. If not, we have to take into account that dynamic behavior with a specific method of our choice. So let's look at this now by just considering a very simple beam model, which has two loads applied to it simultaneously. One load in the vertical direction, P1, and one load in the horizontal direction, P2. Uh, these will create stresses on the structure, and these stresses will be stress tensors at each grid point. So, for example, a quad four element will have, uh, if you request it, will have four corner stresses, and a center stress, and each of those stresses will be uh, a tensor with three uh, components. 
So be aware that stresses coming off structures become uh, come out in the form of tensors, but the fatigue calculation can't deal with tensors, so you'll have to do something to it. For example, pick pick a specific component or convert it to a von Mises or a principal stress before the fatigue calculation can be done. And if we can assume static behavior, that gives us um, uh, the ability to apply a, a simplified approach based on linear superposition. So the, the first thing we notice is that we, we apply only unit loads to the stress solver. So if we're running Nastran, we put on a one kilonewton or one G load in each of the uh, directions that we're interested in. We would then store those stress fields, remembering those stress fields are tensor fields, store those stress fields in the appropriate output file, and we would then switch off the um, stress solver, switch on the fatigue solver, read in those stress field results, multiply them by the actual load conditions in each direction and do linear superposition using the equation in the upper right hand part of the slide which says that the stress time history will be the load time history times the stress tensor result at a particular grid id so this stress calculation is done for every grid id on the whole structure and the stress the the uh, summed stress tensor is then converted into an equivalent stress of some kind and that is used for the fatigue calculation. But uh, just to summarize again, the advantage of this approach is that the calculation can be done essentially with a linear superposition approach, uh, which gives a lot of uh, computational advantages. But of course, if we're dealing with a dynamic problem, then we shouldn't apply the static approach that we've just seen because we will underestimate the response. So uh, the options we have, well, the first option is to let the solver do everything. So specify your time histories inside Nastran, inside ANSYS, inside Abacus. Ask the uh, stress solver to output the stress results. In other words, do a, um, a stress request from the solver directly. Um, Nastran or the equivalent solver will then give you the stress tensor time history or even give you the equivalent if you wanted in most cases. And then you can then proceed to do fatigue calculations for each output point on the model. The difficulty with this is that the stress solvers tend to be very good at the underlying structural uh, determination and very bad at the output request. So this is not uh, a good option for a dynamic problem. If you try to apply this approach for any significant size of model, it will become cumbersome, it will become inefficient and probably not possible to do. So instead, we need to look for a more efficient way of doing this. So around 20 years ago, um, I was involved with a project that was being done for a large truck company in the US, and they were looking for more efficient ways to implement this process. And the question came up, well, what is it that you have to have the stress solver do? What is it that it has to do and what can be done elsewhere? And what you find is that the, the st stress output, the stress uh, request done in Nastran is the inefficient bit, but it can be done externally. So instead what we do is we only get the stress solver to, uh, to do or to output the things that it needs to give, needs to perform, uh, and those are basically two sets of information. We need the, the modal behavior, the modal stresses, which are written by Nastran or equivalent solver into, the, into an appropriate output file. So if it's Nastran, the mode shapes of stress would be written to the OP2 file, for example. Uh, and in addition, we need the so-called modal participation factors. Now, what the modal participation factors are, are the contributions from the loading to each modal eigenvector. So if we consider the earlier case where we have five modes, what you would do is look at the loading and then decide how much of the loading will excite each of those modes. And the answer to that question is created in the form of a modal participation factor for each mode. And essentially those modal participation factors look just like time histories. So the external stress recovery is then done by the fatigue solution. And it's done using the equation shown here, which says stress time history will be modal time history given by Nastran times stress field result at a particular grid ID also given by Nastran. So we sum those for all the modes that then gives us the same stress tensor result that Nastran would have given us if we directly requested that output from Nastran. 
So it's an alternate way of getting to the same answer, but it is a lot more efficient. A lot more efficient. Now, the, the, the time when this becomes uh, cumbersome is if we have a lot of events because the uh, Nastran analysis needs to be done for every single event because the loads are connected to the structure, because the loads are needed in the Nastran run in order, to, in order to recover the modal participation factors. So the first disadvantage of this approach is that you need to do a separate Nastran run for each uh, event, and the second disadvantage is you need to write out modal participation factors for every mode. So, for example, if you have uh, 50 events and 200 modes, you have 10,000 um, uh, modal participation factors. So it quickly becomes very cumbersome for large models with large numbers of events and large numbers of modes. And for that situation where um, you have large numbers of events and large numbers of modes, there is potentially a much more efficient uh, approach. And it's also the preferred method for most dynamic analysts, and that is to switch into the frequency domain. In the frequency domain, we, st we now have total separation of the system properties from the loading. In other words, what, what that means is we generate so-called transfer functions for the structure by applying unit loads to the structure which we, uh, for which we vary the frequency. So we apply sine waves of load. We vary those frequencies in order to create a frequency-based function of response for each output point uh, compared with each input point. In other words, we, we develop a relationship between input and output, which is frequency dependent, and we put that result into the appropriate output file of Nastran, for example, the OP2 file. Now, just to be clear, that result, that transfer function, is frequency dependent. It's a connection between every input and every output, and it's also complex because the output and input may uh, have a phase shift, and so you have to have two bits of information to define that. You need the uh, relationship between the amplitudes of the input and the output. You also need the potential phase shift between them. So the result itself is a, is a complex result, and it's the so-called transfer function. Once we have that transfer function, the response to any input load can then be calculated with a simple multiplication, input PSD times transfer function equals output PSD. If we have more than one input, that uh, summation, that calculation becomes multidimensional, and you would then use the equation below, which says that the stress response is the sum of the individual transfer function components multiplied by the input PSDs and their associated cross PSDs. The cross PSDs are needed in order to account for the correlation between the input loads. So the input loading is essentially a PSD matrix. It's a PSD matrix which has direct PSDs which are real plus um, complex cross PSDs which have two components and I'll come back to talk about that in a bit more detail a little later on. So I'm now going to move on to some new developments related to CA based fatigue. I'm going to talk about um, advances that have made to embed the fatigue technology into the uh, solver, into the FE solver in a more fundamental way. I'm going to start by looking at the time-based approach, and then I'll go on to look at the frequency-based approach. Well, let's begin by considering how we do it, uh, or how we did it before. What, what is the traditional approach? And the traditional approach is essentially a GUI, a graphical user interface-based approach, where the job is set up uh, in terms of um, connections with the solver, connections with various inputs, and a number of files that are also created and used in that overall process. So the first thing we do with the solver is create an output file like an OP2 file. If uh, we're, we're using one of the common commercial codes called MST Fatigue, those stresses in that OP2 file are then uh, translated or converted into a pattern database. That pattern database is then used again to create a third uh, so-called intermediate file, something called the FES file, and that uh, stress file becomes the input to the fatigue solver along with material properties and loading conditions. Those loading conditions are then used to create uh, fatigue results in the form of an FEF file for Patran, and those are read back into the Patran database and plotted. So essentially what we have here 
is a process whereby there is a relatively small amount of data at the beginning, at the Nastra and Solf stage. We generate huge amounts of stresses in the middle, which are then used for the fatigue calculation, and then thrown away before we finally create the fatigue results, which is again a relatively small amount of data at the end. So there is a significant bottleneck related to the stresses, which we need for the calculation, but are not needed at the end of the process. So this, the, uh, the advantage of solver embedded uh, fatigue is the ability to minimize the impact of these intermediate files. This has already been done. Um, MSC software have a version of Nastran which has the, uh, a set of fatigue uh, algorithms and methods embedded inside Nastran. And this gives a lot of advantages uh, to the overall process. It's much faster. It involves smaller file sizes. It's simpler, uh, much more portable because the fatigue calculation is actually part of the Nastran run. Uh, it's also easier for the user to see what's going on because he can see that in, in his input file. Um, and because of the way that MSC software have implemented this particular approach, they're able to do optimization uh, fundamentally at the heart of the calculation. And so it does lead to the uh, possibility of better designs. Without spending too much time on the detail of that approach, I thought it might be useful just to show the additional card entries that exist inside Nastran. Uh, so essentially, in order to get fatigue as an output request, you require inside the Nastran deck a series of cards which are fatigue specific. So for example, there is a fatigue sequence card there which defines fatigue loads. There is a, um, a fatigue uh, material card. Uh, there's a fatigue palm card for defining the type of fatigue calculation and so on. So these card entries, these lines of uh, instructions are essentially become part of the Nastran input file. Uh, those of you that are familiar with Nastran will know that it's essentially a 10 column, eight character format. So these uh, entries uh, are included. So here are the palm entry and the uh, fatigue death entry. And this next slide uh, shows the uh, card entries needed to define loadings, including a sequence card, an event card, a load card, and the material card, MATFTG. So <coughs> these uh, cards are, are supplied and included as part of the um, Nastran input file. And fatigue is then just requested in exactly the same way that stress or displacement or acceleration or velocity would be requested. So it's a very interesting uh, concept that fatigue results have now been uh, added or included as just another kind of output, which is, after all, just what they are. So time-based embedding of the technology was really uh, started several years ago. The first commercial tool was released uh, around two years ago. Um, but there was nothing or, or similar in the frequency domain until very recently. So I'm going to now talk about uh, a similar set of technology for doing the same kind of calculation, but working entirely in the frequency domain. What's interesting about the uh, underlying technology associated with this approach is it's exactly the same technology that you would use to visualize the music that is being played through your iTunes music library. So frequency-based uh, spectrum analysis is something that most people are quite familiar with. And what we're essentially doing here is using the same technology in order to do response calculations and fatigue calculations using those responses. And at the heart of this method is the concept of Fourier series or, or Fourier analysis. And uh, the uh, origins of this can be traced back to uh, uh, Mr. Fourier in the middle of the 1800s, who uh, proposed that there was equivalence between any periodic time signal and an equivalent set of sine waves that can be used to represent that. And this uh, proposition, this hypothesis, is borne out in practice. In reality, we find that time histories can be represented by equivalent frequency domain functions, and that is the basis of the method I'm going to show you over the next few slides.
It would be reasonable to assume that frequency-based methods of analysis are a relatively specialized uh, thing. And yet, when you look into the detail of what actually happens in most mechanical engineering industries, you'll find that PSD approaches, frequency-based methods, are extensively used in more or less all industries. So it's a very widely used approach. Although the, the, the use of the method, the use of frequency domain, is primarily for response uh, not so much for fatigue calculations. And what we're trying to do is extend the approach so that it's also widely used for fatigue calculations in addition to being used for standard dynamic analysis and response calculations. And in a similar way to the time-based based approach, this, the frequency-based approach has some significant additional advantages. The first advantage is that this approach can be a dual approach. So the people that are already doing random response calculations can essentially add fatigue as an additional output request. So that has the potential to combine two uh, design tasks into one. Uh, it, 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 in a similar way to the time-based approach, it's very simple to implement. Uh, it has very robust uh, uh, algorithms and solutions included. Um, it's suitable for very large models. So you could have stress results files that would have used up, for example, 1,000 gigabytes, 2,000 gigabytes of stresses. Those can be processed with this approach. Um, it's been extended uh, over the last few years to make it applicable to situations where in the past it wasn't applicable. So now you can apply mixed, random and deterministic loads in order to do your uh, response and fatigue calculation. And finally, it's been um, extended or at least made applicable to multiple simultaneous inputs. So if you have a car body with 50, 60, 70, 80 inputs with correlation, then those can now easily be implemented and applied with this kind of approach. So let me just summarize then what the differences are between the what I, what I would call first generation approaches for doing frequency-based fatigue, those approaches that which were developed around 20 years ago and are still around today, and what's now possible with the second generation technology. Well, this can be split into two, two different uh, areas. First of all, automotive customers need to be able to apply multiple simultaneous inputs, maybe a hundred simultaneous inputs. And this was not possible with first generation tools. Secondly, aerospace customers want to be able to apply mixed random and, determin and deterministic loads. For example, a sine sweep plus a mean plus a random, or a random plus a narrowband plus a mean, or indeed any combination of those. And these are typically uh, specified in uh, codes like MIL Handbook 810. Uh, and again, first generation tools uh, weren't able to do that. And what the new technology is doing is making uh, these kinds of capabilities part of the standard approach. At the very heart of the approach is a new new way of calculating so-called spectral moments for the system. So these spectral moments inside the, the new technology are calculated using a so-called running sum method. And what this does in effect is it turns very large models into much smaller ones. So if you have a model which has a thousand gigabytes of stress results, but it's got 200 modes, essentially that looks like a, a model which only has five gigabytes of stresses because of the way the new technology uh, dices and slices, takes slices through the structure at specific modes and only ever deals with one frequency component at a time. And the primary advantage of this is that very large models can now be easily processed within the overall approach. So, um, Whereas before there was probably a limit at around 20 gigabytes uh, in terms of stress files that could be processed with this kind of approach, that limit's been removed. There is essentially no practical limit to the size of file that can be processed. In fact, that limit will be determined by your computer hardware, what the, what the computer can actually hold on disk and still see. In terms of the loading that can be applied, this can be uh, standard random PSDs, as in... Uh, in, in figure A, uh, can be random plus harmonics, as in figure B, random plus narrow band overlays, as in figure C, sign sweeps, simultaneous signs, and consecutive signs, as shown in figures D, E, and F, or any combination of the above. So, for example, the random PSD plus harmonics is a typical load specification for helicopters. 
Random PSD plus narrowband overlay is a typical specification for tracked vehicles. So all of these load input types can now be applied inside this new technology. One part of the first generation technology that was very limited was the way material properties were specified. With first generation technology, this was limited to stress-based material properties. And yet, in the automotive industry, they routinely want to apply strain-based material properties. So, the new technology now allows the incorporation of stress-strain material data and strain-life fatigue curves like uh, Smith-Watson-Topper or Morrow. I mean stress correction. Another significant limitation of the first generation technology was the way the stresses were treated. Um, and the, the fundamental problem comes from the fact that the stresses from a, a random uh, frequency domain analysis are complex in nature. And so traditional methods for von Mises and principle cannot be applied. Instead, a, a complex version of those has to be created. And these have now been nicely extended in the latest technology. So you can do a complex von Mises or a, effectively a complex principal stress calculation. The ability to incorporate strain life or the strain life material uh, fatigue approach in the frequency domain required the ability to use something called Neuber's rule or, or a notch correction approach for the fatigue calculation. And this gave uh, a possibility to go back and look at the response calculation itself and see if that same approach could be applied to estimate local elastic plastic nonlinear strains from the linear FE stresses that were calculated by the solver. And so this is also something that has now been incorporated into the latest technology. One of the big challenges for uh, analysts when working in the frequency domain is the pre-processing of time-based data into a frequency domain format. And so the, the latest technology that's now available uh, gives some very nice uh, tools for doing this that take away a lot of the pain that used to exist with previous methods. So typically time-based loading onto a, a full vehicle like a truck cab would be a series of events and for each event would be a series of channels or inputs. In this particular case there are 10 events, each event has 12 inputs or channels. And so the challenge becomes to convert each individual event, which is a time-based phenomenon uh, in the form of usually an RPC file, into its equivalent frequency domain format, which in this case is a PSD matrix. So the 10 events or 10 RPC files here are converted into 10 so-called PSD matrices. Each of these PSDs or PSD matrices then becomes a separate input in the frequency domain analysis. And here we see the format of the PSD matrix. We see that it has uh, uh, 144 terms, 12 by 12 for a 12 input system. The leading diagonal terms are the direct PSDs, which are real valued PSD functions, and the cross PSDs, which deal with the correlation uh, influences are complex terms. In other words, there are two PSDs in each box and they deal with the correlation between each pair of individual inputs. Once that PSD matrix is available and the transfer function has been calculated with the solver, the response can then be calculated using the equation we saw earlier that stress response is the multiplication of the input transfer function terms times the PSD matrix term. So it's a sum of those terms. So in this particular case, there would be a summation of 144 terms in order to calculate the resultant stress response at a particular grid ID. One of the um, major ad advantages of working in the frequency domain because of its uh, efficient approach, the fact that it's very, very fast, is that it can easily be uh, incorporated within a a stochastic analysis. Uh, design uncertainty, the influence of inputs can easily be established and this can also be extended to a, uh, a standard optimization type approach.
These new frequency domain random response and fatigue methods have two big um, application areas where there, there could be significant advantages. One relates to multi-input large uh, systems like uh, full body cars, full body trucks, full body trains, where there are multiple correlated inputs, large numbers of stress response uh, locations. And for this particular uh, type of, of problem, there are some significant advantages of working in the frequency domain. The second big application area of the technology relates to aerospace components where mixed random and deterministic loads are typically required. So here we have um, a navigation pod sitting underneath an F-16 airplane and typical loads on this, uh, on this uh, part would be PSDs, PSDs plus harmonics, PSDs plus narrowband overlays. So these are easily applied with the new second ge generation technology. The setup for uh, this new approach is essentially very similar to Nastran. It requires an input control file, which has the same type of format that a Nastran input would use. Uh, the actual analysis is then run from the command line, and uh, typically you would specify the control file and run the, uh, the job. And as you can see, even for a, a model like this truck cab, which is a relatively large model, it's a very fast, uh, efficient approach. So I'm going to finish with some typical response results that might be obtained. Um, these fall into two categories. So uh, response statistics like the spectral moments or the zero crossing and peak rates on the structure. Uh, the associated irregularity factor can be obtained. Mean stresses, peak response statistics like mean plus three sigma, mean, uh, mean plus three sigma stress, mean plus three sigma strain. Um, the RMS stress, the RMS strain, and where the strain results are calculated, those include elastic plastic uh, components. Um, and then the fatigue results, if requested, can be obtained for damage, log damage, life, log of life, and a margin of safety calculation. These can be calculated for solids as well as shells, uh, nodes, and element results can be included uh, at, at the same time. And this can be done for a specific layer, for example, top layer, bottom layer, or the worst layer. So it's a very um, versatile kind of output that can be obtained. Well, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I've given an overview of uh, fatigue, how fatigue is uh, uh, connected in the fine element environment, how dynamic analysis is typically incorporated. I've then looked at two more recent developments of the technology. Uh, first of all, embedding the technology uh, with the solver in the time domain and then finally some new developments for the same kind of approach in the frequency domain. If you have any uh, questions or queries then please contact me at neil.bishop at cafatigue.com. Thank you very much.